gear-type pumps, which consist of a pair of intermeshing steel gears located within a close-fitting aluminium housing, are the normal method of delivering and retrieving oil in a recirculatory system. This diagram shows a gear-type oil pump. When the gears are rotated, oil is drawn into the pump, carried round by the teeth, and delivered at the outlet. The oil pumps, both pressure and scavenge, are fitted on the accessory housing. The oil pumps are fitted within an oil pump pack, which consists normally of one pressure pump and perhaps as many as seven scavenge pumps. Having several scavenge pumps ensures that the lubrication system remains a dry sump system. Oil coolers can be either air-cooled or fuel-cooled. We've seen that some engines use both systems. If an engine does use both air and fuel to cool the oil, the oil temperature can be monitored electronically and the air cooler switched in only when it's deemed necessary. The oil temperature is maintained at a value which helps to improve the thermal efficiency of the engine. Whether it is fuel-cooled or air-cooled, the oil cooler is basically a radiator which exchanges heat from one medium to another. The oil cooler consists of a matrix assembly which is partitioned by baffle plates. The baffle plates ensure that the oil takes the longest path through the matrix and it thus gains maximum benefit from the cooling effect of the fuel flowing through the tubes within the matrix. The fuel-cooled oil cooler has a double benefit. The fuel in the aircraft wing tanks is invariably very cold and requires warming up before it gets to the fuel filter. The oil is hot and requires cooling. This device allows both requirements to be carried out within it, a rare chance of achieving two for the price of one. Incorporated in the fuel-cooled oil cooler is an oil bypass valve, which is fitted across the oil inlet and outlet. If the oil cooler becomes blocked, when the oil pressure in the cooler inlet zone reaches a predetermined value, the oil bypass valve communicates directly between the oil inlet and the oil outlet. This will prevent oil starvation in the engine and will also preclude the chance of excess oil pressure damaging the relatively fragile matrix assembly. In the event that damage to the oil cooler matrix does occur, fuel is prevented from entering the oil system by the oil pressure being kept at a value higher than the fuel pressure. This is done by a pressure maintaining valve located in the oil feed line to the cooler. Thus the oil will leak into the fuel system rather than the other way round. Chip detectors, which are permanent magnet plugs, are situated in some of the scavenge lines to collect ferrous material from the oil as it returns to the scavenge pumps. The chip detector is retained in the pipeline by a bayonet fitting within a self-sealing housing. The fact that the valve housing is self-sealing means that the detector can be removed without any loss of oil. Contamination of the magnet by iron filings is illustrated here. This type of contamination can be taken as evidence of impending failure in the bearing chamber, which is being monitored by that particular chip detector. We've already stated that to prevent excessive air pressure within the accessory drive unit and the bearing chambers, the interior of the engine must be vented to atmosphere. Airborne oil droplets in the air within the engine form an oil mist which, if it was allowed to escape unhindered, would rapidly deplete the engine oil contents. The oil mist is vented to the accessory drive unit where it must pass through the centrifugal breather before reaching the atmosphere. The centrifugal breather is rotated at high speed and as the oil mist enters, it's thrown outwards by centrifugal force. Around the inside periphery are de-aerator segments. The oil is separated from the air and is eventually flung back into the accessory drive unit to be picked up by a scavenge pump. The air, having less inertia, makes its way out of the centre of the rotating portion of the breather to atmosphere, having had all of the oil removed from it. Thus, the centrifugal breather minimises oil loss in the gas turbine engine.
To facilitate the oil's task of cleaning, a number of filters and strainers are positioned within the lubrication system. The filters and strainers prevent debris and foreign matter from being continuously circulated around with the oil. As we described earlier, the oil is drawn from the oil tank through a suction filter before it goes into the pressure pump. The suction filter takes the form of a coarse strainer, which prevents debris being drawn into the pump and damaging it. At the outlet of the pressure pump, a pressure filter is fitted. This is a very fine mesh filter, which will retain any small particles which might block the oil feed jets. Thread-type filters perform the function of a last-chance filter immediately prior to the oil jets. Each return oil line contains a scavenge filter just downstream of the magnetic chip detector. These scavenge filters will collect any debris returning from the bearing chambers. Both pressure and scavenge filters are constructed in a tubular form from either a very finely woven wire cloth or resin impregnated with fibres. Some filters may have a differential pressure switch fitted across them, or alternatively, they may be fitted with a pop-up indicator, a small button which can be seen protruding from the filter casing to give a visual warning of a partially blocked filter. Gas turbine engine oils must have a high enough viscosity for good load carrying capacity but they must also have a sufficiently low viscosity to ensure a good flow of oil at low temperatures, as would be the case, for instance, when starting after a prolonged cold soak. Early gas turbine engines used the same oils as had been used in petrol engines for years. These oils were mineral-based. It was found that under the higher temperatures and speeds at which gas turbine engines operated, mineral oils burnt, scummed and oxidised. To attain the properties mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, synthetic oils were developed. Synthetic oils have the following qualities. Low volatility to prevent evaporation at high altitudes. A high flash point which will prevent the lubricant igniting at high temperature points within the engine, such as at the turbine bearings. A high film strength, which gives the oil molecules the ability to stick together under compression loads and adhere to surfaces under centrifugal loads. A wide temperature range. Most gas turbine lubricating oils have a temperature range of minus 45 degrees Celsius to plus 115 degrees Celsius. A low viscosity, which increases the ability of the oil to flow under low temperature conditions. A high viscosity index which is an indication of how well the oil retains its viscosity when heated to its operating temperature. Low viscosity oils can be used in gas turbine engines because of the absence of reciprocating parts and heavy duty gearing. However, turboprop engines which have reduction gears and propeller pitch change mechanisms require a slightly higher viscosity oil. Gas turbine engines are invariably dry sump engines. The oil level of a dry sump engine should be checked immediately after engine shutdown, or at least within a specified time after engine shutdown. This concludes the lesson on lubrication.